Warning, you aren't going to find any amateur fanity in this podcast. This week's episode of The Scathing Atheist is brought to you by the new bestiality wedding service that's a logical extension of legalizing gay marriage. Bridegroomer's Wife Wrangling, LLC. Because we're definitely going to get sued for this. Not only is BG Dubs the world's premier provider of non-human slave bride wedding logistics, we also provide a wide range of other services, including those tailored for inanimate objects, like bridges, grapes, very small rocks, and churches. Bridegroomer's Wife Wrangling. We treat animals and objects like the Bible treats women, with animal husbandry. And now, the scathing atheist. Come along to the Australian Skeptics National Convention in October and you will see we did in fact evolve from filthy monkey men. Speakers include Nobel Laureate monkey man Brian Schmidt, monkey woman Susan Gerbic of Gorilla Skeptics on Wikipedia fame, and plenty more. Okay, monkeys, mash that keyboard until you get convention.brisbaneskeptics.org or Hamlet, whichever comes first. Thursday. It's July 9th. And apropos of nothing, a Snapple Peach Iced Tea in Chinatown, New York costs about $2. Hmm. Yeah. I'm No Illusions. I'm Heath Enright. And from Unboiled Peanut Shortage, Valdosta, Georgia, this is The Scathing Atheist. The locals got that. On this week's episode, our show will become legal in Iceland. We learn that Uncle Sai from Duck Dynasty has the exact same resume as Elmer Fudd. And Eli Bosnick will be here to review a Ray Comfort video about people watching Ray Comfort videos. But first, the diatribe. It's very rare that I get a chance to talk to a kid about religion without it being really creepy. And without divulging too much information, I'm just going to ask you to trust me that I was in one of life's rare circumstances where it's entirely appropriate to talk about atheism with somebody else's religious kid. And it was fascinating. You know, he's curious. He's he's trying to reconcile all the conflicting shit he's heard from a parent on either side of the theological divide. And while all the logical stuff that he's hearing from the atheist side resonates with his rational brain, he's not willing to risk burning in hell over a few irrefutable rhetorical arguments just yet. He's making what seems like a rational decision, but it only seems that way because the imaginary stakes for being wrong have been raised so high. Of course, there's nothing new there. That's probably why most Christians believe to some extent. But what made the conversation so fascinating is that at 14 years old, he hadn't learned a lie about why he believes yet. If if he's still a Christian in 10 years and I ask him, why do you believe in God? He's going to give me some kind of convoluted God of the gaps meets first mover meets argument from suspension of all the rules of argument nonsense. But at 14, he's brutally honest. I say, why do you believe in God? He says, because God's going to burn me in hell if I don't. You know, eventually they'll abandon all these reasons and just stick to rationalizations instead. And if you don't believe me, by the way, just listen to any episode of any atheist call-in show ever recorded anywhere. It's the most frustrating thing about listening to something like the atheist experience. You know, they'll ask the people, why do you believe? And then the people will offer up these bullshit apologetics that have nothing whatsoever to do with why they believe. I mean, obviously they don't, because when the hosts read those apologetics, the caller doesn't stop believing. They just move on to the next thing. You know, but the last thing a grown adult Christian wants to admit to an atheist is the real reason why they believe. And why not? Because they talked to some atheist when they were 14 and they realized that none of their reasons stand up to scrutiny. If you ever manage to drill down to it, it's always some combination of fear, anecdotal experience, and cognitive dissonance. You know, the kind of shit that just doesn't sound convincing if you say it out loud. That's why they love to couch mundane shit like, you know, I was bummed one day and a guy bought me a coffee for no reason with a grandiose title like, God has intervened in my life. You know, because if they just said, I believe in God because a dude bought me coffee, they couldn't even take themselves seriously. But if you dig deep enough, it's always going to be something that lame. You know, they'll tell you about an experience with the divine, but then when you demand specifics, it turns out that they're describing the exact same feeling you get when you see the latest Pluto pics from New Horizons or look at a galaxy through a telescope or realize that massage actually is going to turn into a hand job. I mean, how many times has somebody told you about hearing God speak to them, and then when you ask for details, turns out their God sounds an awful lot like the voice that tells you to skip the extra jalapenos this time. And then when you point out that this experience they're using to justify a logically incoherent position is one that you've had and you can explain away without invoking space carpenters, they'll start subtracting adjectives. You know, they'll start getting less and less specific until they've created some phenomenon that completely defies description, but definitely means there's a God. 
And what's more, they'll assert that if you'd had the same experience, you would come to the same conclusion. Now, isn't that just stupidity's favorite stronghold, right? I know what I experienced. Oh, I know what I saw. Oh, so you're the one that's immune to optical illusions, hallucinations, tricks of the light, and errors of judgment, huh? That's you? I know what I heard. Oh, you're already familiar with all the noises all the animals make and all the noises that nature makes and all the audio distortions and echoes your brain can create, huh? And you ruled those all out? I know what I felt. Really? Really? Despite the fact that you said you couldn't even describe what you felt, but you definitely know what it is? But no matter how unimpressive these excuses are, they would always rather throw those out than the truth because the truth is always fear. You know, most Christians, you know, the literal fear of hell isn't going to stick for too long. Most kids grow out of that if they're not, like, drowning in religion every day of their lives. It's just, it's a concept that's too flimsy to hold up to the scrutiny of a fully mature brain. But if the indoctrination has done its job, that won't matter. Because at a certain point, the fear of hell is replaced by a new fear that's a little less frightening, but a lot more tangible. It's a fear of all the time that you've wasted. God has to exist, or you've spent your life dedicated to an imaginary being, trying to win the favor of someone who's not even there. You missed out on all the joyous fornications of your youth and pissed away a finite lifetime satisfying your curiosity with bullshit instead of knowledge. You know, look, your life is all the eternity you get, and ultimately you're going to be tormented by every minute of it you waste. So even though the church is lying about the answer, they're right about the stakes. If you get the God question wrong, you can spend eternity in hell. They're talking about your Jesus. We interrupt this broadcast to bring you a special news bulletin. Joining me for headlines tonight is a man so godless he screams, Oh, your God, when he comes, Heath Enright. Heath, are you ready to be offensively correct on the God Just question once time. again? <laughs> Always, but uh, that's that's not what I say when I come usually. It's, it's Jumanji, isn't it? <laughs> well, only if I'm with Robin Williams. In oh, our wow. lead story tonight from the Arrested Development in Tennessee file. Decatur County Clerk Gwen Pope and her entire office staff of two other people all resigned from their jobs last week in protest of the Supreme Court decision on same-sex marriage. Thanks to the heroic sacrifice made by these three devout Christians, American God's plan to deny legal marriage status to the bustling hordes of gay couples in central west central Tennessee will extend (laughs) a few more days. Or as long as it takes to find three entire people capable of Handing out paperwork very slowly. I love how all the headlines said entire staff. It's like three people, guys. Let's keep this in perspective. <laughs> and you can tell they were county clerks, too, because like the ruling came down on Friday, but they didn't get their asses in gear to resign until like Wednesday of the following week. So <laughs> even when they believe their immortal soul is in peril, they're in no fucking hurry. <laughs> so don't get to say this very often, but it does seem like a pretty reasonable system we finally got going. For this issue. Yeah, honestly. If you're completely incapable of performing your job without violating federal laws on a daily basis, it might be time to resign. There you uh, go. Or keep your job and go to hell. Either way is fine. <laughs> Nobody's judging you or anything. I mean, I'm, I'm judging. <laughs> I'm guessing lots of same sex couples actually prefer it when the clerk is visibly defeated and <laughs> like, feel all gay, oppressed, <laughs> right? and pissed yeah, off. Exactly. I mean, if I was getting gay married right now, I would pay extra for a dejected, homophobic catering staff. They're all. Pissed off, serving penis cake against their will. <laughs> be fun. Raping Jesus one penis cake at a time. Now that is the homosexual agenda. <laughs> and in goddamn blasphemy laws news tonight, we have more good news from seven-lettered countries that start with I and end with Eland. Only six weeks after Ireland's historic vote to legalize same-sex marriage, the technically country of Iceland finally excised a blasphemy law that was damn near antiquated when Viking settlers first populated their shores in the late 9th century. The effort began as a response to the attack on the Charlie Hebdo offices, so if any Muslims were worried that attack wasn't going to change anything, here you go. Just bend over and take that like a kid whose mom hired Muhammad to babysit. <laughs> Motherfuckers. It's a fun visual. Not really. I mean, <laughs> now that, not that fun. That is the type of cartoon that would win a Pamela Geller contest. Okay, we can, we can agree on that, yes. <laughs> All Muslims sodomize Jewish nine-year-olds in this very subway car. <laughs> Paid for by the AFDI. Yeah, right. Yeah, well, and the uh, municipal tax dollars... Uh, and legal costs. So before the measure came up for a vote, the three members of the hyper-minority party that sponsored the measure took to the floor to offer the same three-word endorsement, Je suis Charlie. Reasoning that God was asking for it when he put their country in such a shitty place on the globe, the vote passed overwhelmingly, and I'm assuming, to a long overdue chorus of fuck Jesus. <laughs> yeah. Now, I'm picturing these 
three crazy people from their fringe lunatic party. They're walking up to the podium to talk before parliament. Everybody's all pit. These guys always, they just start yelling about crazy shit like, release the classified documents about the whaling cover-up of 86. It's about... It definitely uh, seems so, like that type of party, but yeah. they totally reversed it. This time, they get up there, they're totally solemn. They speak perfect French. The whole place slowly starts crying and slow clapping. Yeah, no, definitely unexpected. Good job, to, guys. To underscore how unexpected that eloquence was, I should point out that this party is called the Pirate Party. Now, this is not like a weird really gin and tonics linguistic quirk where they just happen to have a word in Icelandic that sounds just like pirate. That's the translation. Right. They're the pirate party. And just so there's no confusion, the political party's Facebook profile is a cat dressed as a pirate. It's fucking adorable. <laughs> like leaning against the wall with his little <laughs> pirate hook. And in the Hills Have Ideas news tonight. The troglodytic Fredo Corleone of Duck Dynasty, Uncle Cy Robertson, <laughs> did an interview with the Christian Post last week, during which he called upon his extensive knowledge of killing birds and his cursory understanding of spoken language in order to construct a logical argument that proves atheists don't exist. Oh. <laughs> which is either useless information or we don't exist, so it's useless information. That being said, would you like to hear it anyway? Well, it's kind of fun. Fuck you for putting me in a position where I must either now lie or fuck up your prepared material. So, <laughs> by all means, of course, I want to hear the theological musings of a man who needs a DNA swab to tell which parts of his face are beard and which parts are swamp fungus. Obviously, why would I not want to hear what Cy Robertson thinks about atheism? Well, he's prepared all the material we need. According awesome. to Uncle Cy Robes, <laughs> quote, I don't believe there's no such thing as an atheist sick sick. What? <laughs> because there's too much documentation. Oh. Our calendars are based on Jesus Christ sick, end quote. <laughs> so what? don't even act like every single human doesn't believe in God because Uncle Cy has the documentation to prove it. <laughs> Filed under it right E there. for uh, every single D human. Yeah. The documentation, right. <laughs> and his argument goes something like this. The creator of the universe invented a new, slightly less incorrect form of the Julian calendar in 1582 and told the mm -hmm. Pope about yes. it. Therefore, <laughs> right. anyone that writes on a Gregorian calendar ever since also signed a belief in God contract without realizing it. That's the documentation he's talking about. <laughs> and in related news, I did the maze on my paper placemat at Katz's Deli last month, so I'm actually Jewish right now. <laughs> Who knew? For the time being. <laughs> Well, and and I looked at Jupiter last Friday on July 7th, so that makes me a Greco-Roman pagan emperor worshipping Arabic Hindu, doesn't it? It's the new rules. Yeah, apparently. And seriously, the whole segment, it was like this depressing, real-life version of Bennett Brower. Like, it wasn't. I've never constructed a logical argument. I don't know how that works. I don't <laughs> bathe regularly. I'm not... Sold on the 14th Amendment. I, I can't count past the gun one. <laughs> right. Yeah, exactly. Never had sex with a woman who has a different last name than I do. <laughs> I don't know how that works either. I, I often secrete steel wool from parts of my face. <laughs> I don't know how that works either. It's really weird. And in Australian fuck hugs news tonight, City Life Church in Melbourne, Australia. Notice I left the R out. I'm multicultural. Well, is in hot you correctly mispronounced yeah, the city. Yeah, thank you, thank you. In <laughs> Melbourne, Australia. Anyway, they're in hot water over a laughably inaccurate sex ed pamphlet they distributed in local high schools, which suggested, among other stupidities, that women should avoid hugs that last more than twenty seconds. <laughs> As their inferior women brains will be overpowered by the oxytocin that's released and will end up unable to resist fucking the huggy. Now, the school has apologized first for the medieval view of female psychology that informed the pamphlet, and then for all the horny dorks that must have been just clinging to every girl in the school for 20-second intervals ever since this pamphlet started making the rounds. I guess this explains why... Australian funerals always break out into incestuous orgies. Right. This, well, this perfect no, no, because I'm saying that's not true, but if it was, that would... <laughs> oh, right. Okay, yeah. well, I guess it doesn't explain the orgy thing. No. <laughs> I, I, I've only been to the one Australian... It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Moving on. Still Moving a, on. Still a mystery. And as if the concept of, like, hugs releasing brain roofies wasn't disinformation enough, the pamphlet went on to suggest that every time a girl has another sexual partner, she loses hearts from her monogamy meter, and if it drops too low, nobody's ever going to want to fuck her again, and she'll spend the rest of her life trying to reason with her cats. And I guess now that we've broached the subject of the church's persistent institutional dehumanization of all the people without dicks, we might as well hand things over to my lovely wife, Lucinda. 
A man wrote the Bible. A whore is what she was. If it's a legitimate rape. It makes you a slut, right? It, cooking can be fun. Hey, I'm proud of a man. This week in Massachusetts. I got an email on Monday from a listener I've been chatting back and forth with for a couple of weeks that just said, this is my problem with feminism. And it had a link to some blog post that a feminist wrote about all the things she's sick of about men. So I read through it, and through most of it, I'm kind of absolutely nodding along with the author, but intermingled with her good points were a couple of points that struck me as indefensible. Stuff like, I'm sick of men thinking they have the right to be attracted to me. So I sent back a response to the listener that basically said, yeah, that's my problem with feminism too. But my response isn't to abandon the label, speak against it, or brush it under the rug. My goal is to steer it back in the direction I think it should be heading. I'm not trying to tell anyone how to speak or what to say, but I'm a firm believer that the vast majority of men are my natural allies in the fight for gender rights. Most men naturally want exactly what I want, equal treatment of the sexes. So when feminists lump men into a single category as the enemy, I feel like it waters down the point and it makes it a hell of a lot harder for our natural allies to line up behind us. But I'm also not naive. I also know that there are plenty of guys out there that talk a good pro-women line when there's a vagina in the room and are all raging misogynists the rest of the time. And those guys love to seize on stuff like the three questionable complaints in that blog post and ignore the other 47 valid points. So when you see this kind of shit, and I'm talking to you guys who don't like feminists, try to keep in mind that if you define a group by the least sensible stuff anyone in that group says, everyone's wrong about everything. If theist went out and found the craziest shit Joe Rogan ever said about religion, then brought it to you demanding an explanation, you probably wouldn't feel all that obligated, even though you and Joe are both atheists. And for what it's worth, I totally agree that all men, and women for that matter, have the right to be attracted to whoever the fuck they care to be attracted to. Anyway, sorry for spending the whole segment on a soapbox, but that point has just been eating away at me all week. So with a solemn promise to get back to covering news stories and making penis jokes next week, I'll hand things back over to Noah and Heath. Thank you, Lucinda. And in Norwegian wooden news tonight, a Catholic diocese in Norway has finally given the non-child fucking lawyers in the Vatican something to do after accusations came down from the government that the diocese defrauded the Norwegian taxpayers out of about a million dollars a year over the last five years. <laughs> How, idiots. you may ask? Yeah, really. Well, Norway has some incredibly bullshit provisions carved out for the few floundering religious institutions, like a tax subsidy based on church membership, which, surprise, surprise, is corrupt as fuck. <laughs> idea ever so right? if your stupid thing offers a product that it never delivers mm -hmm. and also doesn't exist right you shouldn't need a government subsidy should i mean like if farmers in iowa were selling uh corn futures on planet krypton i think they'd find a way to stay afloat <laughs> yeah, without exactly. a subsidy <laughs> Just don't get caught raping a bunch of kids, and that's a profitable gig. You're all set. Well, I think you've touched on the problem. Now, between 2010 and 2014, the Oslo Diocese registered about 65,500 new members, and according to prosecutors, as many as 17 out of every 20 were registered fraudulently leading the government to overpay the diocese by more than $5 million over that period. So that works out to about, oh, I don't know, a dollar per Norwegian. There's only $5 million of them. Well, isn't the church supposed to provide welfare programs? Not yeah, right. From this, not the whole, whole reason we give them all those crazy tax exemptions and all the other Apparently, bullshit privileges they get? not in Norway. And look, I, we're talking about one of the least religious countries in the world. Only about 2% of the population goes to church, and there's 5 million of them. So... If the, if the Oslo Diocese numbers aren't bullshit, more than half of all Norwegian churchgoers started going to Catholic Mass in Oslo over the last five years. <laughs> and I've got to assume they didn't offer, like, atheist vouchers for that huge majority of citizens who weren't eligible for the faith stimmy checks yeah, that right, everybody else was getting right, exactly. they were in a church. And finally tonight, in Tween the Sheets news... Liberty Council founder Matt Staver accidentally gave the sodomite extremists a good idea last week during his appearance on the Crosstalk radio show. After host Jim Schneider pointed out that 
same-sex marriage rights are about to bring about catastrophic consequences for public education, Staver agreed wholeheartedly, quickly adding, oh yeah, you, you must mean how every school system is about to start forcing kids to have sex during their kindergarten class. Yeah, that's absolutely <laughs> happening. I heard about that too. No, seriously, it is. I mean, it's only supposed to be the gay kids, but still, that's pretty I, It's pretty like messed they've up. got their own fucking language or something. Because <laughs> like, Schneider people. says, well, you know, gay people being married, that'll be detrimental to the public schools. And I'm thinking, I, like, I can't even imagine how you're going to connect those two disparate. Like, give me, you know, grant me talking snakes, worldwide floods, and a vengeance bearer for bald people and I still cannot connect the dots of crazy that it takes to get from gay marriage to public education. <laughs> but Staver doesn't even miss a fucking beat. He's like, well, sure, because now kindergartners are going to have to gay fuck to get their chocolate milk, obviously. <laughs> what oh, the fuck is going on in your gray matter? No way those dots connect with kindergarten. That definitely <laughs> yeah, exactly, shouldn't right? have been one of the dots. Wow. <laughs> so it's nice to see the competition for craziest gay marriage reaction didn't dwindle in week two. No, not That's at all. Nice. Matt Staver actually thinks the Department of Education will soon require teachers to tell their students, quote, hey, you need to experiment as a kindergarten with whether you're male or female. You need to, like, have some experiments and go out and have some same-sex relationships, end quote. And damn Actually it, said that. children being subjected to forced gay sex experiments in the public schools is just yet another example of a secular institution moving in on religion's turf. That's the church's <laughs> job, people. So, quick recap. Now that gay adults are getting married, Matt Staver sees no way around five-year-olds having mandatory butt sex at school. It's and inevitable. I think, I think that might be a slight <laughs> mischaracterization of his opponents on the <laughs> issue. I, mean, I don't think... Big gay even considered forcing small children to sodomize each other at school <laughs> until Staver said something. Well, anyway. Yeah, now that he brought it right. up. So, so now it's probably going to be that, too, and the children's books about ass and mouth stuff. Either way, though, we're going to need 30 seconds on the clock. Book ideas for the sodomy education curriculum that now starts in kindergarten oh. at every public school. Go. Um, rowdy with a chance of me balls. <laughs> what about gay sops fables? A collection of homosexual beastie allegories. <laughs> Maybe one fist, two fist, red fist, blue fist? The, the, the fist wouldn't be blue. It would be red, though. And for the five-year-old lesbian with a foot fetish, boots and puss. <laughs> Let's see. I'm, I'm sure we used uh, Charlie and my chocolate factory for a shit porn at some point. So how about the, uh, the Dr. Seuss classic, Oh, the places it'll go. There's no walket in my pocket, kid. <laughs> Happy to see you. All so. right. Well done. And now that you've... Thoroughly segued to the shit porn segment of the show. <laughs> what about Scat in the Hat? Oh, yeah. Then the Hungry Scatapillar. <laughs> um, little House on the Prairie Dog. Hop on Poop. How about Two Girls, One Sippy Cup? Oh, God. <laughs> uh, maybe James and the Giant Breach. <laughs> Booty and the Bestiality. <laughs> it's mammals. Or, or Where the Piled Things Are. <laughs> Bit of a stretch or, out of that one, I guess. Of Sodomice in Men. Journey to the Center of the Girth. <laughs> The mouse at Pooh Corner. Uh, everybody poops if you pull out the anal beads too fast. You know, you let, let them know so that they won't be embarrassed the first time it happens. No, it happens to everybody, kid. Don't clench. Now, <laughs> I think, honestly, though, what we really need to do is finally get some of this sodomy stuff on the internet. It's See, about I mean, the, damn Isn't time. that where the, all the kids are going these days? <laughs> Learn about underage there you go. gay stuff. All right, so what about <laughs> the thesecretTindergarten.com? <laughs> Discreet playdates. And, and, of course... Kindergrinder.com. Because, yeah. So, same Ooh. sex. All right, with an all new appreciation for the fact that we no longer website. put the transcripts on our website, we're going to close out the headlines <laughs> for tonight. Heath, thanks as always. Jumanji. And when we come back, Eli Bosnick will be here to earn us 6,000 emails reminding us that Ray Comfort is from New Zealand, not Australia. With all the cinematic heft of the please silence your cell phones now real and all the cultural sensitivity of the mask of Fu Manchu, the new film Audacity demonstrates that Ray Comfort is a raging dick and if there was true justice in the world he'd have to spend the rest of his life passing poisonous jellyfish through his urethra. I have seen children have more fun watching their dogs get euthanized than I had watching this miserable piece of hate speech and keep in mind that most of the time those kids had no idea I was about to kill their dog. Now, 
under normal circumstances, we try to give Eli at least a month's worth of recovery time after watching a movie as criminally ridiculous as See Me Dance. But when Ray Comfort writes and produces an anti-gay propaganda film that reminds Christians that it's their biblically prescribed duty to tell every gay person they meet that God will burn them in hell for all the butt-fucking, well, those just ain't normal circumstances. So, Eli, welcome back, sir. Thanks for having me, guys. Okay, so now tell me, where does this rank in the pantheon of the worst things that you've ever seen? And please, include roadkill and defecations in your calculus here. (laughs) I actually did put my dog to sleep, and I have to tell you... I will choose that. I mean, I would put it, I would put my current dog to sleep right now. I will snap its neck on Skype over the, each of these podcast listeners will get to hear the crunch of a one year old pug's neck as it turns 360 degrees rather than listen to Ray Comfort slowly make people uncomfortable in a youtube montage oh my god so like because yeah, i was thinking that should be the ranking of of this movie instead of like one to five stars it should be like one to ten euthanized puppies like how many puppies would you rather kill than watch this movie right it's like a what would you do for a klondike bar but in reverse <laughs> right. what would you do in order to not watch this movie would you kill your dad would you take that gun and kill your dad right there or would you watch ray comfort confuse people by asking them to read passages out of a Bible and then pretend that they had agreed with it, even though they had just read it out loud because that's what he asked them to do. Right. <laughs> um, yeah. All right. So, so that's actually, actually the opening of this movie. We see the, the, the chick, she's sitting in her car um, talking on the phone and um, the, the poor man's Michael Chiklis runs up to the window and starts banging. She starts screaming. He breaks the window and that scene is over. Eventually, yeah. I we thought that was it. Michael Chiklis for a while, and I was like, wow, <laughs> the shield really went downhill. <laughs> right. This is, this is rough. Come on, Mike. You can do better than this. <laughs> Everyone do can do work. better than this. <laughs> yeah, well, and speaking of stage work, that's the oh. next thing we get to in the film. Now it's time for comedy! <laughs> no, this, it isn't. <laughs> this was my favorite part of the movie, because I had a great realization during this, is that this must be what comedy is when you can't talk about anything because you're a fucking crazy person, right? right? You can't talk about, like, dating or sex or Mm -hmm. life or children or joy. So you just (laughs) have to imitate stuff like a trick dog. So that's the comedy they show. It's just like, and this one here is Barack Obama, and then he's talking to Arnold Schwarzenegger. Arnold Schwarzenegger's like, ooh, wow! Right? Because that's what they talk like. Help me. Help me. I've made a terrible mistake. I can't escape my own delusions. <laughs> and then he goes to his, like, just incredibly racist Indian voice or, or whatever he's oh, going yeah. for there. Oh, yeah. I was about, I wrote down 30 seconds of this movie, two terrible moments of full on racism. Oh, it was so bad. And it was, again, no joke. It's just, boy, those, those folks from India sure sound funny when they talk. <laughs> now, and I, and I do think that it's an, it's also an, another interesting look into Ray Comfort's soul that this is what he finds funny. He saw this guy. There were a bunch of other comedians and impressionists. He saw this guy and he's like, oh, that's my guy right there. He's real funny. You should see this thing he does. He talks like Barack Obama. But, but you got to understand, he's not Barack Obama. Yeah? He's not Barack Obama in the ring. That, that, that threw me at first. I was like, oh, my God, it's Barack Obama. How did he get in here? And I tried, I tried to grab him and wrestle him a little bit. But yeah, 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 yeah. Wouldn't him. Wouldn't him. So when he turns into other people, it's not a demon. Not a demon inside his brain trying to come out as Barack Obama. Yeah, it's not that. He's just pretending to be another person. Yeah? Yeah, it didn't make any sense to me either. But what are you going to do? <laughs> the argument this movie makes is when you call us a bigot, it hurts our feelings. Right, right. <laughs> That's what they want you to take away from this. Is not We don't have a good reason for us to be saying these things, and, which they fucking don't in a no. movie about why you say these things. It's like someone trying to tell you not to get your coat out of the closet in case you fall through to Narnia. It's like, thanks, man. <laughs> I got it. Now stop trying to create laws that I can't reach in and get my fucking coat. Right. <laughs> I get it. You don't have to reach in and get a coat. I'm going to go ahead and snatch my jacket and leave. But Mr. Tumners! Yeah, I get it. Mr. <laughs> Tumners is going to reach out, and grab my wrist, and I'll be trapped in there for three years, have to fight a lion, a witch. I saw, I read all the crazy books that you did. All right, so then after the terrible comedy, we meet uh, Diana, and and when we first meet her, she's sitting in a restaurant having uh, a lunch or whatever with her cardboard two-dimensional friend, and the topic of the discussion seems to be exposition. 
Yeah, no, they, they talk into the screen like an, it's like a second language film. Like, if this were Muzzy, I'd be like, oh, I get it. They're just <laughs> communicating information. They're just talking about whatever's in front of them. I've, I've, I've done Rosetta Stone. I get right, it. Right, right. This is like a Rosetta Stone video where they just never include the other language. And they do, and again, they speak entirely in exposition. Mm-hmm. This is, the only way they could have included more exposition in these opening scenes is if Ray Comfort had just sort of stumbled out in front of the camera, like the fucking Emperor's New Groove llama, and been like, all right, here's the deal. All right, I'm just going to let you in. She's a, she's a lady. Going to be a lesbian. And then this is a man. Yeah, they're friends. He's a comedian. She's a she's just a lady. Didn't really think of anything for her. They're gonna watch some of my YouTube videos, and you're gonna watch them watch my YouTube videos. Doesn't that sound terrible? All right, back to my crazy mobile. And then he poofs away. That's the only way this could have been more obvious, and it would have been more entertaining. Any so they, any change that you made would yeah. have made this movie better. So they go. So they're at the office, and she's sitting there, and she's doing that. You know, maybe it's experience in community theater, but there's that, there's that person who can't act doing something before another person walks into a shot thing, <laughs> kind of acting. And I can watch it for, eating out of their bowl of cereal. <laughs> right, I could watch it for 95 hours where just this person who cannot act and be in their own skin is just like, and then I cereal and mouth and cereal and mouth and cereal. Oh, num, 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 num. I bet this cereal is delicious. And then he walks in and she's like, oh my God, I was alone on camera for like four seconds. <laughs> oh, you don't know, but there's like a pool of urine underneath me from the idea to be alone on the camera. And I was just putting cereal in my face like I'd never eaten before. <laughs> So he comes in and they're chatting and she's like, eh, how's your day? And they're kind of flirting. Mm-hmm. They're kind of flirting, but I can never tell if anyone's flirting in Christian movies because no one wants to fuck each other. Right. They just right. instantly want to get married and then rape babies back and forth. <laughs> <laughs> so they come and sit down and she goes, oh, what are you looking at that? And he, he, he like gets embarrassed and he goes, oh, just the Bible. Just yeah. like just casually e-reading the Bible. And she acts like he just said... Shit porn. I'm looking at shit porn. Um, yeah, it's everyone underage. in this movie reacts to the word Christian the way normal people react to the word rapist. Right. <laughs> if you can, you can play a fun game where you just shout rapist when everyone says Christian, and all the characters on screen react the same because they'd be like, "Oh, I'm actually a rapist," and she's like, "Oh, that's fucking hot. Oh, why did you tell me that? Oh, it's hot. You should be in jail. You should be in jail." <laughs> And she says, well, you know, my sister is gay. And he's like, oh, what? And again, the only argument they make is just like, well, you could, you could stop picking on us because, you know, just because we want to take away your liberties doesn't mean that we don't have feelings. And I'm just like, cry me a fucking river, you right. little bigot. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, she goes, so do you believe gay people should be stoned? And... He absolutely says nothing like no. He says nothing to correct her and leaves. That's it. Yeah, he doesn't go, his oh, no. straight to a lesbian elevator. Yeah. I totally don't believe that. He goes, well, it's a little bit more complicated than that. No, it's fucking not. Nope. It's zero percent. When someone yes. asks you, it's a fun, moral, handy dandy. You can tattoo this on your ball sack and do an avasna every time you need to check the answer on this one. If anyone asks you, should X be stoned for Y, the answer is No. <laughs> The answer is always no. This is not a Do tough you question. want to rim someone after they've eaten Indian food? No. <laughs> Should anyone get stoned for anything they do? No. Right. Except maybe make this movie. <laughs> <laughs> oh. So after the ambiguous answer to the death to gays question, he, he, he hauls ass over to make this delivery, and he winds up in an elevator... With a couple of lesbians. And, of course, the lesbians can't kiss or do anything too gross to freak out the audience. So they're, they're holding hands. That's how we know people are gay in this movie. They hold they're holding hands. hands and they're smiling and happy. They are the most likable people in this movie. They really are, yes. Peter's like, what are you guys doing? We're lesbians. <laughs> yeah, exactly. How's your day going? Just munching some carpet and getting <laughs> married to ruin yours. <laughs> So he takes the – and now, first of all, keep in mind that we've got a a, 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 misfun- a malfunction with the elevator that's like it stops and the doors won't open. 
and the next time someone gets on it, it's going to plummet to their. They're going to plummet to their death. I don't know how this happens with an elevator, but it does. <laughs> well, the doors are attached to big scissors, and so oh, when you I- push them open, <laughs> they slip the top, and it falls. I mean, I'm no scientist, but right, I'm pretty right. sure it's yes. like a. Yeah, exactly, exactly. The white spy had been right. through there earlier uh, or something along those lines. So so Peter comes back around and he sees that his danger, deadly elevator sign has been removed by the Christian who is slightly more bigoted than him. And they actually go into this slow motion, six million dollar man run. And he goes, no. Yeah, and they go, no, nah, Yes. And they fall to the bottom of the elevator yes. and die. And you just hear the fucking sound effect. You don't see anything. And then Peter wakes up and it's all a dream. And we have no idea how much of what we've seen now is a dream. There's no cue the whatsoever. Whole movie. No. I wrote, it was all a dream. What a weird dream. What a terrible movie. <laughs> right. So upon having this horrible dream, whatever, Peter wakes up and he decides he needs to figure out God's trying to send him a message. Um, that right. he needs to learn how to tell gay people that they're going to hell correctly. So he Googles right. that. Yes. So he, go- he, he Googles how to speak to, and then he pauses, uh-huh. and I wrote, fish. No, no, come on, stay focused, gay people. <laughs> <laughs> you just really want to be Aquaman. <laughs> Just a fish jumping out of the water next to a gay couple. You guys are going to hell! (laughs) And of course, what does he get when he Googles how to berate fags? He gets... Half of the movie. (laughs) Yes, exactly. (laughs) He gets half of the movie in montages because they were too lazy to fill out a 49-minute movie with all movie. It's all people realizing they're talking to a crazy Uh, person. They're obviously at a music festival (laughs) or in the park. They're doing something. And Uh someone comes up and goes, what do you think of gay marriage? And they all, because they're New Yorkers or wherever they're from, go, yeah, gay marriage is great. We're all in favor of gay marriage, being gays. You're born being gay. And then he starts to ask crazier and crazier questions. So what this actually is footage of is people getting uncomfortable and trying to end the conversation by agreeing as quickly as possible. And I've done it. Homeless guys are like, hey, man, what time is it? 4.43. Sure is hot out there. Yeah, it's pretty hot. You know it's because they put airplanes full of chemicals in those chemicals. And I'm like, yeah, man, totally. (laughs) Right. It's it's like if that guy made a movie to prove that we all believed in airplanes full of chemicals. Just like, now this is me talking to a gentleman who was just trying to eat lunch at work. And you can see he definitely agrees. Yep. Yep, Yep, airplanes full of chemicals. Wow, this elevator's taking a while. (laughs) That's all these things are. And it's just, it's one of these, it's so clearly people not having the 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 ability to communicate to him that they disagree and are uncomfortable because uh-huh. they'll be like yeah so you know all right I want you to read this it says here uh, Spider Man Spider Man <laughs> does whatever a spider can yeah so would you say would you say you can do whatever a spider can yeah would you and they're like oh I mean yeah obviously like according to that so yeah 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 so Spider Man can do whatever a Spider Man can yeah and you're not Spider Man are you yeah you're not Spider Man well I mean. Nobody's Spider-Man. Oh, but he says right here in this comic book. He says right here in this comic book. Can you read that? Um, Spider-Man, Spider-Man. Would you sing it? Uh, Spider-Man, Spider-Man. I actually, I gotta go meet my friend. Just, just read the comic book. Does whatever a spider can. And this one clip keeps coming back. It's a gay woman, and she goes, I really appreciate the, you know, the loving, um kind way you've put this. And what she means is, thanks for not screaming fag at me. Right, right. Because right. that's the only good thing she can think of in that horrible interaction she had at Ray Comfort. Is him just not being like, get in here! You're a witch! I'm gonna ban you! I'm gonna ban you with a cigarette! Give me! Give me! So she's like, so she's doing the like, gold star for not trying to bite my foot. Yeah, right. He's like, eh. And they show it through the movie like she has changed, like she is no longer gay. Right. Yes, basically that's the closest anybody comes to saying, yeah, whatever, whatever. And then he like acts like, see, I just, I just taught my person how to be gay. Now they're straight and they'll take the dick like they're supposed to. <laughs> and they're like, yeah, it's, we will leave. Just go away. You first though, have to leave. 
Yeah, you have to go first, and then I'll get a right on that. I really will. And and see now, up until this point, this has just been (laughs) another really poorly put together, stupid, horrible movie. But when you start getting to the the YouTube clips, this is where I stopped having fun. You know, because this, like, I, I, it was still. Were you having a lot of fun uh, in, until this point? Well, I mean, like, I have <laughs> the, fun the with just the murder part in the elevator. Yeah, was that fun, that yeah. was hilarious. <laughs> but, like, no, but I mean, I have fun with bad. Is that you could jerk general. off to? But yeah, exactly. But this part, you could you I put very two, specific you put taste. two lesbians in an elevator. I'm jerking off. I, it, it's really uncomfortable for them when they're in the elevator with me. But hell, you know, there, there, there are we have we all have needs. That's why you scream. This isn't learn. about you, at them. <laughs> right? <laughs> so they understand. <laughs> This is even worse than when Ray Comfort came up to us the other day. It's your message, message so, No, boy. no, it's not. It's but not no, worse than no, it Comfort. really, yeah, like Sir, every go one ahead. of them would have watched me jerk off in an elevator rather than continue that conversation, <laughs> man or woman. So, but, but that's, but that's kind of like where I realized, okay, this movie has gone way beyond you know, the kind of, like, like in persecution, right? They were obviously talking about gay marriage and gay stuff, but they, they were like kind of skirting around it and being at least somewhat culturally sensitive to it. This movie threw all that shit out in the, out of the window and just became blatant fucking hate speech right about at this time. Just went on it. They were just like, pull no punches and all about it. And the thing is, all of the points in the YouTube montages, which by the way, let's just appreciate the fact that Ray Comfort made a movie about people watching his YouTube yes. videos. How fucking crazy do you there's have to be? There's actually a goddamn spot in this movie right about here actually where there's a, just a, a series of montages of clips of people saying that Ray Comfort makes sense. Right, and all out of context, too. Yes. So he could be like, excuse me, is that the L-I-R-R? Yeah, yeah, no, that's it. That makes sense. Great. Okay, good. <laughs> Wonderful. Go, man. Right. And there's the one guy who's like, wow, man, you really changing my mind right now. I would love for you to leave. I would just love for you to leave. <laughs> right. <laughs> oh, my mind is so totally changed. If you were to leave, I don't know how much more changed my mind could get if you were to go far, far away from me and let me finish my, my lunch alone where you are not. <laughs> <laughs> oh god it was so fucking bad but don't worry we'll get back to more ray comfort youtube in a minute but now peter armed with this ray comfort information goes back to work now keep in mind that we knew this was a dream sequence we had we have no idea how much was a dream sequence so we still don't know really if the conversation he had with her was part of the dream we have no reason to believe it was but apparently it was so he comes up to her and this is how he opens the conversation with her uh-huh do you have a dyke sister? Is your sister a lesbian? Yeah. Because I dreamed that she was. Yeah, I dreamed your sister was gay. And yes. let me tell you, I've used that as an opening line a lot of times. <laughs> it does not go over well. Mace takes forever to get out of your eyes, guys. Just listen to, e- listen to Eli and learn from my mistakes. I dreamed your sister was gay is a real bad way to open a conversation. <laughs> And in their second conversation, again, she says to him, she says, doesn't the Bible also say you should stone adulterers? Like, doesn't the Bible say a bunch of crazy shit? And he goes, funny you should say that because poof! Yeah, right. (laughs) Huzzah! Jingly keys! Jingly keys! Just don't put it in the movie. If you don't have a good answer, don't put it in a movie. When my girlfriend comes home and I'm hanging from my neck by a belt, I don't try and explain it. I just... I just don't Carry on. talk about yeah, it. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. If she doesn't ask, you don't offer it. You finish yeah, up and it's you move like on. Ray doesn't, yeah, exactly. It's like Ray doesn't understand that he this controls isn't about what you. everyone <laughs> says in this movie. Lock he controls eyes with me. what all the characters say. <laughs> I'm sorry, I was moving around from the asphyxiation uh, orgasm a little too quickly. I have bad habit. It's it's better oh, to go too quick too than too fast you can't on move or too, too slow on that one. All right, so You'll pass out as you stand up. Now, exactly. Now, in this second YouTube montage, this was the point in the movie where I just grabbed my pencil like a child grabs a crayon and wrote "fuck this asshole" across my notes because okay, at one point, one of the people he's talking to says, "Well, if God hates people being gay so much." Why did he make me gay? This is Ray's answer, and I went back and wrote this down. This is verbatim Ray's answer. The exact same reason he made adulterers, fornicators, thieves, and murderers. Those were his exact words. Being gay is like stealing and murdering. That's what he's saying. To a person who'd already told him he was fucking gay. I I liked it because the react, just the expression on the guy's face as Ray is saying it, again... There, there is no worse cinematic choice. 
if you want to train an army of bigots than to watch someone's feelings get hurt as you express your fucking crazy opinions. Because there's no, there's nothing that's going to discourage people more than watching that poor fucking guy's face just crumple as Ray Comfort's like, yeah, you just like a murderer. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> you just like a murderer. And he's like, oh, you're a fucking nutbag, aren't you? Oh, my you're just God. A, why do you get a vote, you fucking <laughs> nutbag? Oh, my it's God. The, it's just fuck, and again, everyone, everyone in these YouTube videos is so, is like, oh, well, there goes my phone. <laughs> What's that? Oh, my Batman has got to go to harm friends. Credit to clock trip. Get a pen and, sorry, man, gotta go. Looks like I'm having a stroke. <laughs> or maybe they could use the excuse that Diana uses when um once once she's watched this this uh video montage, she has a question about God, another one that they don't bother actually answering. She turns to him and she says, Well, okay, I have a question for you about this whole Jesus nonsense. My brother has real bad cancer. Why would God do that? <laughs> So weird. Just one more thing before you go, Peter. It's, it's not a big thing, but I hate God so much. <laughs> so much. Is, Could you since you're claiming to be an expert on God, I, I have some questions about uh, why we killed my brother. <laughs> right. I love so, the idea, too, that he has real bad cancer. That's how she refers to it. I guarantee you they were like, what kind of cancers are they? Well, there's, there's the real bad kind, right? That's the one that kills you. All right, great. That's what we want. That's what we want. Conversation yeah. over. <laughs> the key here is really that people watch a bunch of people on YouTube be made uncomfortable as I get a microphone as close to their face as possible without getting arrested. <laughs> anyway, so they go into the store, and here's our cast of characters in the store. We have very obvious gay couple. They're holding hands. Um, mm-hmm. Straight couple. And the guy with the words armed robber tattooed across his forehead, stalking back and forth in the potato chip aisle, looking menacingly. Again, they're just like, he could have, he could have been dressed as Yosemite Sam, and they would have been like, yeah, no, that's a little too subtle. (laughs) Again, just Ray Comfort crawling out in front of the camera. You see that? See that? He's a sketchy fella. What's he up to? Bad to find out. Tune in. Tune in. Yeah. Yeah. Would have been so much better. And then Peter evangelizes his way out of the robbery. It goes to show you how boring it is to be evangelized to that an armed robber would rather be like, oh no, I don't want to, I actually don't want to be near you. I'll just, <laughs> I'm going to go ahead and take another hostage. No, I'm a Christian and I want you to shoot. Yeah, no, I get it. I get it. I just... <laughs> I'm on a bunch of meth right now, and I'm the second least pleasant person in this room to be around right now. (laughs) And I'm threatening to murder everyone. (laughs) The Indian guy behind the counter is like, he's right, you know. He's actually a lot better. (laughs) At least if he shoots me in the face, I'll be dead. I won't have to watch Ray Comfort videos. (laughs) You get it? Because that's what they sound like. (laughs) Got a future in stand-up comedy. I I think so. I think so, sir. So... He gets distracted by the cops coming out, and because the because the guy's white and he's holding a gun to someone's head, the cops don't do anything. Right. <laughs> That's probably why they didn't make the character black. <laughs> you guys better back up. One of these lives doesn't matter, so go ahead and open fire. <laughs> oh, I, I didn't realize they were in Cleveland. <laughs> All right, so so then and then of course, um, yeah. So Peter comes out from behind with a can of spinach, guys. You get it? Because somebody said Popeye earlier in the movie. Uh, and so now I he's didn't gotta, get it. Cause I fell it. asleep. <laughs> <laughs> so now, if, if if you're curious what Diana was doing after being shown the hate speech videos for uh, by by Peter earlier in the day, she's gone home. And is now like addictively watching Ray Comfort videos the way I watch you porn. <laughs> right. Yeah, exactly. She's, she is doing what everyone who listens to this podcast does with Intelligence Squared debates, but she's doing it with crazy Ray Comfort yes, exactly. videos. <laughs> He's just like, well, listen, I'm going to play some games on Armor Games. I'm going to listen to Sam Harris beat up William Lane Craig in the background. <laughs> oh, it's so good. <laughs> oh, that's a, that's a great one. That's a great one. <laughs> yeah. But instead, but instead, I just want to hear an Australian man bother teenagers. Right. Just like, you know, I've been thinking about it. All right, right. So, you, you know how, you know how sometimes, right? You know how you're a murderer? I'm not, I'm not a murderer. You know how you're a murderer there? Look at this book. 
There's this, in the third montage, we're now on the third montage. Yes. It's where he's basically telling people to tell him that they're going to hell. Yeah. Uh-huh. He's like, so the book says you're going to hell. you go going to hell. And everyone, it's so edited. Everyone's like, I guess the book says I'm going to hell. And he's like, yeah, gotcha. Yeah. Gotcha. The last words were I'm going to hell. So. Right. And the guy goes, well, how would I not go to hell? And he's like, well, you take a magic, magic spell. And you wave it around your head. And the woman who is a Christian is like, listen, Christ is my Lord and Savior. That's all I need, which I'm ugh. But, but sure. And he's like, no, 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 that's not enough. It's not enough. You gotta, you gotta read it. Spider Man, Spider Man <laughs> does whatever a spider can. I get it. He does whatever a spider can. Yeah, Uncle Ben died for your sins. I get it. I get Uncle Ben died because he didn't stop the guy. This is the worst. Well, I and just then- want to go back to. My music festival. <laughs> oh my god, these poor people. And then okay, when somebody doesn't understand what he means by saying the Lord's name in vain, he gives him the example by saying, you know, like you say, oh my G-O-D. Like the guy has to spell the fucking word out like a nine-year-old. Right, when exactly. He's saying, like he doesn't oh want his god. toddler to know he's going to the zoo. Right. And his toddler <laughs> is the creator of the universe. <laughs> Well, I don't, I don't want to make him mad, right? But I want to F U C K Y O U in the A S S. Yeah? Now, God doesn't know how to spell very good because he's not real, right? And his vision's based on movement, so maybe if we hold real, real still, God won't see these two sinners, yeah, when he comes by with his magic laser guns. Yeah? Starts frying people up, like laser guns. Shrimp on the barbie. You know how it is. Yeah. <laughs> it's fucking crazy. Now, uh, uh, Peter has just saved the gay people with his can of spinach or whatever. And they invite right. him to dinner. So we go to dinner. At with... a restaurant that has nothing but hot sauce. That's <laughs> right. the, at, the theme at, of the at restaurant. At TGI apparently. Fridays. They take them to a not nice version of TGI oh, right, Fridays. right, yes. Uh... <laughs> and at that dinner, the most offensive thing in the movie to me happens. He does that. Here's a hundred dollar tip, oh, but it's actually oh a Jesus comfort thing. Fuck and you. Fuck, fuck those people. As people, everyone here, I think, at some point has worked in the service industry. Uh-huh. Way too long. Fuck you. Yes. There is no better way for me to put the fluids that were once in me into your beverages and or food <laughs> than to do that to me. There's, you could be like, hey man, can I suck your dick? And you have less chance of having my cum inside your mouth than if you give me that $100 thing with the Jesus pamphlet on the back. I'm just letting you know. I'm letting you know you get my mouth babies. It's the fucking... And so the gay guy... So the, the one of the gay guys is... I, totally reasonably offended by the fact that he starts to prophetize to them. Right. He starts handing them pamphlets about how they're going to go to hell because they're gay. Right. And he's like, hey, uh, you know what? I don't think this is a good idea. We should leave. Um, I I don't really want to read any of your fucking literature. Mm -hmm. And and again, the argument this movie makes is like, we really like it when you read our literature. (laughs) It's like, I don't give a... Again, cry me a fucking river. Who gives a shit? And then he turns to his boyfriend and he's like, don't bring this home. (laughs) To which the gay partner responds, oh, I'm I'm probably not going to. It's, It's just... (laughs) <laughs> just being nice. I, just, I already ordered the cheese sticks, so yeah, uh, uh, you know. So they fucking. <laughs> so then, then they the the one reasonable member of that couple leaves, and they have a talking about Jesus montage. Yes, they do. And they have a talking about Jesus montage because there's nothing to say, right? <laughs> so they have to have a montage. So it's just like making really good points and the gig got nods. He nods because all these points are so great. He's witnessing to him. Oh, that's a good point right there. Maybe I don't like dudes. Witnessing montage now. I mean, like the whole movie is about how to talk to gay people as a Christian. And then when you actually get to the point in the movie where he's a Christian talking to a gay person, yes, it's just a musical montage of, yeah, he's probably the, saying some pretty smart shit right now. That gay look guy looks pretty convinced, doesn't he? It would be like, it would be like if at the end of all the Rocky movies, we just cut to a, a montage of someone watching and the guy being like, yeah, Rocky's doing pretty well. <laughs> right? Oh, yeah, yeah. So it appears that he is much better at boxing than he was at the beginning of the movie. <laughs> And he's won. Seems to be getting he's strength. He's won. 
And he's won. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Except for Rocky V when it's a street fight. Oh, yeah. The best no of the foul. Rocky films. Oh, God. One more round. <laughs> the best of the Rocky films. Ding, ding. <laughs> It was so bad. So she drives by, and then she runs out of gas. So she parks on these train tracks, and she makes this phone call where she's like, Peter, I've been thinking about what you said, and I really want to talk to you about it. And then the hitchhiker guy, so he's he's banging on the window, and, she, and this is the scene from the beginning again where she's like, ah, 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 ah. and so he smashes the window and drags her out just as a train Hits the car, which again we do not see because no. this movie does not have the budget to hit not a even car close. with a train. Like right. basically, they have the budget that, like, if we had to put a train crash into this show, it would have been like on the same budget they had. So yeah. <laughs> oh yeah, Ray, Ray Comfort just did all the Foley sounds himself, just him alone, <laughs> just being like, "Oh yeah, here comes a train, clippity 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 clippity, hey, it hits into a car. I'm a car. Oh no, run 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 run. Oh, can't get away, clippity 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 clippity." And then he listens to her voicemail. Peter listens to her voicemail after he's done fucking killing it with his Willy Wonka impersonation. <laughs> And it turns out that she was a lesbian the entire time! Oh my god, yes. The woman that he was showing gay hate YouTube clips to at work turns out to have been a lesbian. That's the twist ending of this movie. What we see, we first, we see her, like we're looking at her desk, so we see the pictures of her with her lesbian girlfriend. And then we see her open Bible, and it's open to 1 Corinthians the passage, this is the passage about, you know, neither homosexuals nor fornicators nor whatever. And like fornicator and homosexual are highlighted, underlined and circled. And we stay on that for, I think I counted it out. It's like nine seconds that that's on screen that we're looking well, at. Well, they gotta a Bible let all the page. audience sound that word out. Yeah, you know, exactly. everyone in the, everyone like who's watching that movie has to be like, right there. Yeah. Forninicators. <laughs> for minute, form, form, forminish maters. <laughs> Farm it. Sweet potatoes. Sweet potatoes. Do you know sweet potatoes aren't allowed into heaven? <laughs> no, wait, wait, good. They're keeping it up there. Fornicate. Oh, right. Oh, I, I get know it. That one. <laughs> Me and everyone else who isn't a crazy person. Yeah, right. <laughs> so, now, just in case you didn't catch the, tr- the metaphor we were going for with the train, which is even when big crazy guys come slamming at your fucking window, sometimes they're trying to help. Just right. like Ray Comfort is a big crazy guy slamming a microphone against people's faces. He's just trying to help. But in case you didn't get that, we get it explained to us four times in the last 60 seconds of this fucking movie. One of which is in a news report yeah. where she's like, I'm a news reporter. A good <laughs> Christian was trying to save a lesbian woman. She didn't want to be saved, but sometimes when you don't want to be saved, it's better to be get saved. I'm a news reporter. <laughs> For News McNews reporter, I'm not someone's cousin, news reporter. The good news is that it's mathematically impossible for the next movie that we review to be less enjoyable than this one unless you have to get bitten in the nuts to see it. So until then, Eli, thanks for suffering alongside us once again. Oh, thanks for having me, guys. Before we shut the fuck up tonight, I wanted to offer an all-too-infrequent thanks to all the listeners that help us out every week by sending us news items, ideas for 30-second spits, ideas for top tens, and concepts for skits. I honestly don't think we could manage without you guys and gals. There's way too many of you to thank by name, but you know who you are, and I hope you know how much I genuinely appreciate your help and how awesome I think your vaginas and or dicks are. Anyway, that's all the blasphemy we've got for you this week, but we'll be back in 10,022 minutes with more. If you can't wait that long, be sure to check us out on Facebook and Twitter for occasional bonus nuggets of scathism. Obviously, I need to thank Heath, the Michelangelo of Dick Jokes and right for his tireless efforts to make this show great. I need to thank the lovely Lucinda Lusions for not having me committed when I spent an hour screaming fuck this asshole at my computer this week. I need to thank Eli one more time for the film review equivalent of self-flagellation. And of course, I want to thank Skeptomite of the Brisbane Skeptic Society for providing this week's Farnsworth quote. If you're interested in finding out more about the Australian Skeptics Convention, you'll find a link on the show notes for this episode at skatingatheist.com. But most of all, of course, I need to thank this week's most venerable vertebrates, James, Brian, Curtis, John, Heather, Kevin, Christina, Corin, Richard, Paul, Matt, and Chad. 
James, Brian, Curtis, and John, whose cocks are so mighty they can't convert to Judaism until Moyles get lightsabers. Heather, Kevin, Christina, and Quarn, who are so bright you can determine their chemical composition with a spectrometer. And Richard, Paul, Matt, and Chad, who are so virile the stripper doesn't even need a pole. Together, this congregation are in commendation when they hasten the expiration of predation and exploitation from the orations of damnation, not to mention the molestation, as well as the separation of education and indoctrination with an augmentation of our accumulation of communication telling the zealous to go procreation themselves by giving us money. Not everybody has the bona fides it takes to give us money, but if you'd like to feed us your bona, we'd be happy to take it. You can make a per-episode donation at patreon.com slash scathingatheist, or you can make a one-time donation by clicking the donate button on the right side of our homepage at scathingatheist.com. And remember, the only reason we're able to keep doing what we're doing is because so many of our listeners have chosen to generously support our efforts. Not like there's a long list of advertisers lining up to sponsor the Fuck Jesus and Rape Puppies show. So all jokes aside, to all of those who currently support the show or ever did, thank you so much for letting me do what I love to do. If you have questions, comments, or death threats, you'll find all the contact info on the contact page at scathingatheist.com. All the music used in this episode was written and performed by yours truly, and yes, I did have my permission. Do a lefty. Yeah, right, fucking Sometimes. A. I switch fucking it up. A. I fuck fucking around a. with it. Yeah. Sometimes I do the steeple church thing. <laughs> you never do the steeple church. I just, I might next time.